Call this meeting to order, please. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pointed towards me. Okay. All right. If you would please, please turn off your cell phones. And what do we decide, um, Mr. Campbell? Okay. Uh, request to withdraw specific items from consensus items. Anybody have any? Nope. nope. Okay. I move that the following consensus items be approved as listed in the administrative memorandum A through T. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That was quick for the first couple of pages. Okay. That moves us right up to the uh, point in time where we ask anyone from the audience, of which is lots of you tonight, to uh, come up and we have two minutes for you. And we'd like to have you give your name and your affiliation, please. Anyone like to? Hello. Hello. My name is Carol King and I'm a first grade teacher at JLP. My other my first grade colleagues and I got together and thought it would be a good idea to update you as to how things are going with our new first grade teacher that you were kind enough to let our opening district hire. Um, the uh, interviewing process went swimmingly and worked highly effectively and our new teacher Katie Mathis is proof of that fact. She is working out wonderfully well. Um, the way most of us are using her, we're increasing our number of small reading group time with her to compound what we already do in our classroom. She's working primarily on skill building and oral fluency, which is the key component to work on a developed to reach the ultimate goal, which is increased comprehension. We're also using her to work with mathematics and strategy comprehension, as well as fluency with math facts, which is coming back into play uh, due to the common core. We're using her primarily in the core subject areas. We also, a few of us, are using her in writing group instruction and um, practicing those skills that we learned during our writing workshops. Other than um, every indication leading to the fact that our upcoming benchmarks and um, looking at the recent data will show that our students have increased. I just received today um, current benchmark uh, progress monitoring information from my reading special at our school and all of the children that are additionally working with Katie as well as myself and Mrs. LaRosa have shown some incredible strides since Great. her uh, appointment. Um, I would also like to tell you that above and beyond the data, and the core subject areas that we're having her work with, the environment and the feeling of the children is one of less stress. They are genuinely noticeably happier. They're getting more time with adults, um, not only instructional time, but time in general. The classroom is less crowded during instruction as we're able to take our children to either this room that she shares with Mrs. LaRosa if, if it's available, and also another classroom that is working for the teachers as well as in there. So it does um, give them a change of state, which is also very valuable to children at this age. So I would want to thank you again for that appointment. And as a separate fact, I know my two minutes is up, but there was a parent who uh, gave a letter that she wanted to help write. She's unable to be at the meeting. If I could read that from her, I'd appreciate it. All right, real quick, please. Okay, thank you. Um, it is from Mrs. Tina M. Powell. Dear board members, I will not be able to attend the Board of Education meeting this evening. However, I did want to address the board members. I want to thank all of you for GLP's new first grade teacher. I personally was very happy to meet her and I hope other parents were as well. I realize now is the time when you are all working on the budget for next year and I would implore all of you to recall the words I've spoken at previous meetings. My children and the other children at GLP deserve to have smaller class sizes. They deserve to have teachers who are not overwhelmed by the sheer number of children in their classes and can actually spend quality time with them. Please know I will continue to raise my concerns at future Board of Education meetings as long as it takes for the situation to be remedied. I thank you for your time. Sincerely, Tina and Powell, concerned parent and town meeting resident. Thank you so much for your time, and once again, thank you for appointing the new first grade teacher. Thank you.
Good evening. Um, I'm Colleen Cott, the ETA president, and this is Mark Bona, our vice president. And it's good to hear some positive news about the addition of the teacher. I know at the last Board of Ed meeting you had asked individuals to come to you with suggestions regarding cost cutting measures and what would have the least impact on our students. So to help with that process, collaboration is the key. And with the first draft of the budget now available, please be ready and willing to meet with the departments where the cuts are eminent. All right, take the time to come in and look at these departments, see why they are scheduled the way they are, see what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, and share with the obstacles, you know, when you sit with them, share the obstacles that you as a board are facing with the budget. And then when the final decision is made, all parties can leave the table knowing that at least they've had their concerns heard. And hopefully this will build some kind of consensus. Um, I think you'd agree that being proactive is better than being reactive. And also, when you're looking at scaling back on some programs, please keep in mind your Board of Ed goals and ask yourselves, how will this impact the district's efforts to become the top 10 of the Erie County Public School System by the end of the school year 2013-14? The Board of Ed goals do state that a completed and fully vetted long-range plan um, will be developed by all stakeholders by July 2014. So what is the Board of Ed's plan to provide the necessary resources and support to help the faculty and staff meet this goal? The ETA leadership is ready and willing to be a part of that process, actually kind of excited about it, and we're looking forward uh, to working with the board on the development of this plan and the upcoming budget process. And as you've heard, I want to thank you again for the installation of the new first grade teacher. She's become an invaluable part of the GLP, and this shows what including teachers in the decision process can help avoid these similar situations in the future. Thank you. Just in addition to what um, Colleen just read to you, uh, we'd like to ask that if there is a timeline for our ideas, for bringing ideas to you, we'd like to know, you know by when we need to get these to you. Because yes, it is nice to be heard, but it's also nice to know that we're bringing information to you that's useful and that you can actually do something with. So if you've got a deadline on this, when you need to hear things by, please let us know what that is. Okay. All right, thanks. Grade, fourth grade, and seventh grade. Hi, I'm Karen Salomon. I have two kids in school, second grade, and fourth grade. I am Karen Sauter. I have two kids, third grade, and fourth grade. I'm Russ Sauter. I have two kids, third grade, and fourth grade. Um, my name is Karen Sauter. I'm the school administrator for the Erie County and a concern with the classroom size for uh, grades kindergarten through sixth grade. Mr. Schaefer and I uh, spoke about this a couple weeks ago, and I just wanted to share this concern with the entire board. Um, as you can see from the group standing here, there are parents that are concerned and interested. Not everyone um, may be comfortable speaking in front of a group, uh, but there are parents out there that are interested and want to get more involved. So um, it's especially personal to those of us that have kids currently in second grade and below. For the class that is currently in second grade, a teacher has been moved out of this class for the last two years. They went from five to four teachers for both first and second grades. There are currently 99 kids in the class, and while this may have been acceptable in the past, uh, it isn't now because of the diversity of the students in the classroom. I do have the numbers, Mr. Schaefer uh, shared those numbers with me uh, last week, and the current enrollment for each of those grades. Um, and the facts are that there's new curriculum and changes to state testing, and the enrollment numbers in February are very different from what they are in September. Um, so why am I speaking to you today to voice my concern for the classroom size, encourage parent involvement, and also provide some suggestions to changes impacting classroom size. Uh, first thing that I would like to suggest is maybe um, getting involved with decisions being made about classroom sizes and teacher slash grade level shifting during the budget process. You know, we're early on in that. So 
uh, encourage a more long-term and not reactive approach to classroom size and movement of teachers, identify how the classroom numbers change over the summer, um, suggesting five teachers per grade, kindergarten through sixth grade, and also encourage the board to replace a retirement in the elementary school, as this will likely impact the size of the class that is going into third grade again. For first and second grade, that classroom was went from five teachers to four, and they, uh, my daughter has 25 kids in her class. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jackie Gould. I am a parent of three um, students, sixth grade, fourth grade, and a second grader in the district. Um, I am also concerned this evening about classroom size. Um, several weeks ago, when there was a bout of um, illness going around uh, the GLP, my second grader came home from school one day, and that day, and she was so excited. She came to the house and she said, Mommy, we had so much fun today. There were six people absent today, and we got so much done. It was so fun. And just, they, it was just amazing. So you see, normally her classroom is full with 24 students. Even with 18 kids still at school that day, the teacher managed to spend more time with each student. They were able to have a very productive day, and my child came home happy and energized. Years ago, a classroom of 25 to 30 students of the same academic level could be manageable, but this is not the case in today's classroom. With the mainstreaming of students, there is a wide range of academic ability and special needs in each classroom. Our wonderful teachers have to juggle their time to teach all of these different levels and their variables, and the more students there are, the less time that the teacher can spend with each student. We all understand the need to pare down during these times of financial difficulty, but please don't let it be at the expense of our children's education. So I'm asking, please restore a fifth classroom for each level. If the second grade class this year is at 99 right now in February, it's very well, very well may, may well be higher in August. Please provide our children in these lower grade levels the same opportunities as those in the higher elementary levels by restoring these positions. Thank you. Spring of 2005, uh, a group of parents spearheaded by Terry Ziddle approached the board about possibly um, beginning a cross program. And that group of parents started that fundraising. The board at that time said you can have the program so long as there's the interest to do it, but also you do all the fundraising to feel that team. And so that parent, the parent group did that. They did all the fundraising. And since then, we've had a varsity program. The following spring, we asked for JV. They said the same thing. If you can fundraise and there's enough interest, you can do it. 2006, we brought in our GMB. 2007, we asked for a modified renewal. It was asking a lot, 30 in a row. We were asking the board, can you implement a new team? And 2007, they said, you can fundraise. But at the time, the superintendent said, that's it. No more new programs, no more new levels. So we've been fundraising ever since to um, keep our modified team afloat. And in the interim, we've grown by leaps and bounds. Um, this week we've had signups, and 7 through 12 on the boys' side are 74 um, players interested. I'm not sure if you had 60 on the girls' side. So this impacts a lot of families out there. Um, every year we raise the money, between eight and $9,000, to put the program out on the field. It's raised by the parents through fundraising. There's never any treadmill of fundraising. And then we turn the money over to the district and poof, it's gone, and we're back at square one, planning for the next year. Um, so we've come tonight to ask, I know all the academic issues, I said to Jack already, we're kind of like a fart in the wind, so I <laughs> catch much here, but we're here to ask, because it doesn't hurt to ask, um, for us to at least be considered to be on that same level playing field as all over the club. When we are absorbed by the actual sports budget and taken on as part of the uh, sports budget. Jack, we've heard something for you. Hi, my name is Jack Cuddy. I have uh, three sons in Eden, grades uh, 7, 9, and 11. And I just want to read a few things. Obviously, Chris pointed out a number of issues, but let me just uh, gloss over this real quick. I'm speaking on behalf of the parents. 
supporting both modified girls and boys lacrosse. For those of, uh, of you who are not aware, lacrosse is the only modified program that is self-funded, meaning the money is needed to run the program for transportation, coaches, equipment, uniforms, etc., are all paid through fundraising. All other modified programs are funded by the school. Additionally, Eaton has the only self-funded lacrosse program in any local school. The approximate amount of money needed to run the modified girls and boys program is eight to nine thousand dollars. We're asking that uh, the athletic budget be reviewed to see if we can include that. We understand that these are challenging times for the school district. School districts everywhere. We ask that you keep in mind that these are also challenging times for parents. We believe it is therefore unfair to ask the parents of modified cross players to pick up the full cost of playing when this is not true in other modified programs. Meanwhile, modified lacrosse players are proudly representing their schools, wearing their school colors on their jerseys, but the school does not represent the team. According to data from the National Federation of State High School Association, the number of boys varsity programs has increased 55% over the last five years. The number of girls varsity programs have increased 48%. Both figures are the highest totals among high school sports. Locally, the Eaton Summer Program, as Chris had mentioned, had, has at least 100 participants annually in the lab over the last three years. Simply put, lacrosse is one of the fastest growing sports in the nation. It is rapidly growing in Eaton, and it should be supported by the district. Finally, I did a little homework. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word fair as treating people equally without favoritism or discrimination. In addition, the Macmillan Dictionary defines the same word this way. If a situation is fair, everyone is treated equally and in a reasonable way. The across families of Eden are only requesting to be treated reasonable and therefore in a fair way. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Lisa McCastro, I teach art here at the high school. Um, just wanted to let you know that Mr. Graff and I just returned from uh, an award program put on, sponsored by Metro Group for Ad Craft, and out of seven overall places, Eden won five. We won the top three places in the Eden, in the, in the Hamburg Sun, and we won the third place overall, over 70 schools, as well as the People's Choice Award. Oh, great. Um, it was $330 in total, and we were told by Metro Group, as we always are, that Eden is probably one of the best participants they have, that our work is beautiful and noteworthy, and that um, there are a lot of businesses and companies that look for us to do their ads every year. So I just wanted to let you know that. Yeah. Half of the art program in the music department. I wanted to tell you that um, this is not to brag, but I wanted to let you know that Lisa, um, she uh, helped my daughter draw, and Chrissy was just nominated to uh, become an illustrator for New York City Book Company because of Lisa. Okay. So I want you to know that we really have to think about the music. Ms. Tylock, uh, Stacy uh, sings all the time, and she made her become. Um, the music singer that she is. So I just want you guys to think about the music program and the art program. And I know I wasn't supposed to talk tonight, but come on, you guys know me. <laughs> Um, I'm Lynn Morgan. I've been a teacher in this district for 17 and a half years. I'm uh, certified in both English language arts and art, but right now my primary responsibility is in the art department. As we discuss eliminating classes with smaller enrollments, I want the board to be aware of two issues facing students in our art department, but it does pertain to many of our other areas as well. Um, first, last spring we had 62 students select the basic studio and art program class as a first choice, which is a prerequisite for many of our other classes. When the results for the standardized test came back, however, a full third of these students, 20 students, were identified as needing AIS services, which caused them to get pulled from our enrollment from that particular class, um, bringing our numbers down. And I know it applies to other special areas as well. 
Um, second, a few years ago, we were given the directive to offer no new electives. Now we have about six 70 plus minute periods of study hall in the high school per week. And that's in addition to the 42 minute advisement period. Um, it's my belief that if more electives were offered through the art department and other subject areas, and fewer study halls, early dismissals and late arrivals were offered, our students would be getting a better and more rounded education. Finally, it's unfortunate and not fair to our students who have a talent or career interest in art, music, technology, business, etc., to have fewer opportunities for an education in these areas just because they come from a small community. Many of these programs expect for admissions a certain number of courses to be taken at the high school level. They expect a large and diversified portfolio and a certain level of education and confidence from our students entering these programs at a higher educational level. We place our students at a disadvantage when they are not able to take the courses they need in our high school. So as you can see, lower class enrollments in the high school are often the product of issues out of our control. However, it is not beneficial or fair to our students to offer them fewer educational opportunities to prepare them for their futures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for with music, I've been playing violin since I was four. It was a huge, huge part of my life. And it's the one, I think, one class for the kids who are in it that they get to just feel expressive and they don't have to have to live up to other people's expectations. They can feel however they want to feel. Just, they don't have to be perfect at it, but they can just feel good about themselves no matter what. And music's all around us and we can't get rid of it going to be here, so why not just keep it? It makes other kids feel good. It's a big part of our community. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a question for the board on what your position is on bullying inside the school. Our position on it? I'm right, because my daughter's been bullied for the past three years, and to this day, it's not been taken care of. So I just want a board position on that, so where I should go from here. Well, we have a policy on that, and we follow the policy, and if it's not being taken place, if it's if the policy is not being followed, then it needs to basically be taken up through the proper channels. If that's not happening, then let us know. Then come to you? Yes. Okay. And Basically, an email would be on the website of the school. Yes, our emails are are there. Or you can send it to me, and I'll forward it to I mean, Mr. That's, Cerny. That's the best way. If, if if you had a discussion with Mr. Schaefer about this yet? Not with Mr. Schaefer, no. Okay, then but that the would be the best place. Right, that would be the best place to start, I would think, unless there's a specific building. No, you can person. start with me. I'll get okay. it to well, the right place. I started in the elementary building and continued into the high school. All right. Okay. So if you start talking, with Mr. Schaefer, then we can go from there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right, last chance. Thank you very much. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> that was close. All right, we'll let you slide in there. I'm, thank you. I'm Sherry Stoneberg. I'm here to represent the Family and Consumer Sciences Department. Um, myself and Diane McGill uh, teach the Family and Consumer Sciences classes. Between the two of us, we teach both you know, middle school and high school level. I would just like to point out that our classes are a multi-age classroom in a lot of situations. Um, it also is an opportunity for multi-intelligences to come together in one classroom. Um, our enrollment also is the same thing as what Mrs. Morgan was saying. Sometimes I feel like we're a victim of our environment and a lot of kids would like that opportunity, but to pull it away from them seems like a big disadvantage. So I would love to invite any of you to come on up and see what we're doing in our program. We are very welcoming. We love to have you out there. So please consider all of our options before we do anything. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sue Schnaufer, the elementary computer lab teacher. I'm also a parent in the district, as well as an adjunct faculty member at UCC Community College. Listening to everybody talk tonight, it, um, it really impacts our kids, our families, um, our programs when it comes time for the budget. 
you know, we all have to think about what's best for our taxpayers, but we also have to think about what's best for our children. Um, in another year and a half, we have park exams coming up, um, which are going to be computerized exams. Um, a lot of preparations that need to be um, taken for those exams for kids. Um, we also have a directive, I believe, from one of our parent committees to um, increase the number of um, college level courses that were being offered. Um, some of these um, proposals of cutting at the high school could severely impact some of those potential programs, as well as taking people from um, the high school situation and putting them to the elementary level, um, which may not be in the best interest of the kids at this point. So I ask that you really um, think about the decisions that you're going to have to make. I understand I'm a taxpayer. You know, my, I, I don't necessarily like it if my taxes go up or how my taxes are impacted. Um, but I have a daughter that's going to be a senior next year that I was really looking forward to her being able to take some college level classes. And I'm afraid that maybe that might not happen. I have first graders that are going to be impacted by the park exams the very first year that they're given. I want to make sure that they have a very solid foundation in their computer education so that their computer skills are not affecting their park exam score. Um, so I will be contacting you. Um, my, my department, my business department, Joanne Ramakers and I have been brainstorming. We've got lots of ideas. So um, you know, look forward to some emails and we'll be, we'll be contacting you. And we know it's a tough decision, you know, but we're there to work with you too. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I was starting to wonder, yeah. I'm Kathy Jeffers, I'm a teacher at the GLP. And you've heard a lot of people talk about what they don't want cut, and I agree completely. But I think we also need some ideas of, of how to solve the problem. From what my understanding, the problem is um, a funding gap because of state decisions not to provide the funding that they have in the past. Um, Pretty much? Well, we also have significantly escalating costs too. Right. Yes. So perhaps one thing that we all can do, parents and students and board members and everyone is write to your state people and tell them to please restore educate the funding to our public education. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. have to like an auction. Going once. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. All right. Moving down our list. Mr. Campbell. Okay. Uh, new business. Resignations. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the resignation of Director of Finance, Lisa Almasi, be, accept be accepted effective February 28th, 2013. The board and administration wish to thank Ms. Almasi for her seven and a half years of service. Second. Second. Discussion? Thank you very much. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, uh, item C, FBLA overnight field trip. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the FBLA overnight field trip to the New York State Association of FBLA Student Leadership Conference and Competition April 10th through 12th, 2013 be approved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Accessing of computer equipment, I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, computer and other equipment as presented be declared excess and disposed of as the district deems necessary. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Risk assessment update, I move that upon the recommendation of the audit committee, 
the risk assessment update from Bagat and Laredo Bagat be accepted as presented? Second. Discussion? Um, Michael and I went through this. We were all fine with it with the audit committee, so um, <coughs> I think we're good on this one. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, transfer of funds from SDMT number two project. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the unexpended balance of $9,734.29 from the SDMT number two project be transferred into debt service. Unexpended funds must be used to reduce debt service on the project. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Standard workday and reporting resolution for appointed officials. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the standard workday and reporting resolution for the treasurer be approved as presented. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Budget increase. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the 2012-2013 budget be increased by $4,834.25 to $25,197,630.06 to account for increased revenues. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. These two over here. Got the other ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Item I. Vacation and sick leave agreement with Ronald Bugs. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the vacation and sick leave agreement with Ronald Bugs be approved as presented. Second. Discussion? Does everybody get a chance to read through that and understand it? Okay. All right, um, I want to make sure we understand the numbers here because it's a big amount of money we're, we're spending here. It's $81,000 that we have to pay out. Okay. How, how did we get to $81,000? Um, I did. It's broken out. Now. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, da, da, da. I put together a summary. Let me get four. What's that? Yeah, we could do that. Would you rather I projected it? I got so sure. Can see uh, yeah. I think that's a good idea. We borrow your cord, Mr. Schaefer. We'll see if we can make the technology work. Do the handouts for you guys too. No. no, is our sure. expert coming to help us? The casket. Which one is it? We were both in the helmet and this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's what I got to. The next team jumped the gun. Yeah, he did. Yeah, panicked out of the gate. You know. the mouse. There's the mouse, that's why it's not reacting. Next one over. That one right there, yeah. Okay, it's up on the screen. You see it? All right, like some copies the other way. Three, four. I'll share. I'll share. It's showing. It's All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Oh, I can share it with you. Don't stick it next to it. It was there. There you go. Don't, don't mind him just stand there. <laughs> okay, Steve, you might want to lean in. Yeah, I guess you want to hear what I have to say about this one. Um, just so we're clear now, this is a re contractually required payout that we had to give to Mr. Bugs. Um, this had nothing to do with the timing of when he left. This is not any kind of buyout. It was nothing like that. These were just agreements that previous boards had made with Mr. Bugs in his contract, and we were contra contractually obligated to pay these monies. Okay, so probably is important that we're going through this because I want you to understand this is not something I'm very happy about writing these checks, um, but legally we have no choice. So, so if you take a look at what we're paying out here, it's it's vacation and sick days. Okay. 
So there's vacation in the one column and sick in the other day. So the way it works on his initial contract, he was uh, basically given 25 vacation days per year and could accumulate in the initial contract 30 of those days. All right, so he could keep 30s. And the payout was 1 240th of his final salary or whenever he gets paid out, which is $583 per day. So that initial grant of those 30 days or the ability to accumulate those 30 days was worth $17,500. Okay. The sick days uh, he was granted at that time were 15 per year, could accumulate up to 240, but there was no payout for sick days at that time. His contract was amended. Um, he, I also listed who the board president was at those times. The contract was amended um, in 2007, where the, uh, the number of days could be accumulated and paid out was increased to 55, which then burdened us with another $11,000 for payout. And again, no payout for sick days. He got a new contract in 2008. There was no adjustment on sick days, but at this point, um, he must have asked for and was given to him $55, $55 for every sick day for a payout of $9,900. So that was another $9,900 basically being accrued against uh, the contract. And then really the, the worst, the one that hurt the district the most, in my opinion, was in 2010. Um, this one I know about. I was there at the meeting. In fact, Kristen was there too. Kristen and I voted against this. But Mr. Gannon, Mr. Bergstaller, Mr. Breyer, and Mr. Howard all voted for this. And what it did was change his payout for sick days from $55 a day to $291 a day oh and gave him another $42,500. So if you add all those increments up, we have to pay out $28,700 in vacation pay, and $52,483 in, in sick days for a total of $81,216. And since uh, budget is very tight this year, we actually have to take that out of our reserves to pay this bill. So, uh, anybody on the board have any questions about how we came to that calculation? Steve, where does this uh, 2008, those 55 days come from? Sick so days. $50. He was... Awesome. If the, there are the, no. That's a standard amount. That's in almost all of our contracts. I believe it's in teacher contracts and it's also in administrator contracts. But for the, um, basically, he was given a rate of $55 for all of those sick days. Okay, so he, he must have asked for it and then they granted it to him. And then they went and changed it to one 480th of his salary, which made it from $55 each of those days, that then became worth $291 for each of those days. In 2010, then? In 2010, yeah. We had quite a discussion about that contract. What was the number again? 200? Which one? What did they move from? 55 to what? From $55 a day to $291 a day. Big jump. That was worth $40,000. So Steve, what was the vote of the board in 2010? In 2010, there were six of us on the board at the time, and Chris and I voted against it, and the other four board members voted for it. Four to two? Four to two, yeah. So, um, so again, this was something contractually before this board's time that we were obligated to pay. Um, and to be honest, we're not happy about it, but we don't have any choice or we'll end up in court. Um, anybody else have any questions? So you've got the detail about the, the contract, the buyout, and all those kind of terms. So this is like two teaching positions, pretty much, is what it comes out to. Um, yeah, probably one and a half, yeah. That's nice. Do you have a question? So this, this has to be paid, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we have to pay vacation within about eight days. Correct. And then the other is paid out mostly retirement is received. this year and then some the following year because of the 403B conditions on it. Yeah. But we, to be able to fund this, we have to take it out of reserves. Right. So it's coming out of the employee retirement. Employee benefit accrued liability reserve. Right. So we'll have to t we'll have to make a motion on that as well to, to cover that. It's coming out of the employee benefit accrued liability reserve. No, oh. that'll be yes. the next motion to actually approve taking it out of there. How much is in there um, approximately five hundred thousand. Okay. And uh, legal counsel reviewed this and advised that we're basically stuck with it. We're stuck with it. We went through lots of negotiations. Um, the number actually he was expecting was higher, and we negotiated down a little bit 
um, based on his interpretation of his contract. But um, yeah, it's been reviewed by legal counsel and we're, we're stuck with it. Uh, we're not, we're not going to field questions from the audience on this, I'm sorry. Anybody else on the board have any questions? No. Okay. All right. Um, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Okay, this is, this is a related motion. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, $81,216.95 be transferred from the employee benefit accrued liability reserve to the general fund to fund the vacation and sick leave agreement with Ronald Bugs. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Um, item K, vacation leave payout for Lisa Almasi. I move that upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent, the vacation leave payout for carried over and earned but unused vacation time in the amount of $7,336.22 be approved for Lisa Almasi. Second. Discussion? I'm just curious, is this coming out of the same fund? No, actually there is money in the budget for it instead of diluting that fund even more, the reserves. Yes. Again, this is a contractual obligation. Seven and a half years. Yeah. How long was Mr. Bugs here? Mr. Bugs here, 15 years. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Can we get the agenda back from the green Yep. All right. I believe. Okay. All right, I believe that covers everything on the agenda there. Now we're going to move on to presentations, and I believe we're going to look at the food service program first. I'm Susan Nestle from um, First Central Food Service, the Director of Food Service Operations. Sure. Um, I was asked to give a quick presentation on the National School Lunch Program changes or the regulations uh, that came to, into effect this year and how they impact the school district. Um, let's go back to last year and the previous 15 years. Uh, we were doing many based plan, um, menu planning which is nutrient standard menu planning. And what that involves is your entree side dishes and um, your milk and dairy products. They're all combined into a meal, and that meal was analyzed, and it had to meet 33% of the RDA and calories, ion, calcium, vitamins, vitamin C, um, all your nutrients. And um, the USDA had decided to pass a hungry, Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act last year. And what this act that came into effect this year, what this act does is everyone is on a component-based menu plan, which means there's five components that we use for our menu planning now. And of those components, there's a meat, fruit, vegetable, whole grain, and milk component. What this has done in these components is not only did they say that you have to use these components, what we're using, but there's mixed minimums and maximums of all of these components that we can use to make a menu. Um, there's new age, age groups that we have to follow. The age groups are K through 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12. All of those are different menu groups that they have to have. There's calorie ranges for each age group. There's a minimum and a maximum that you have to keep in between for every meal. Um, daily portions on calories, grains, and proteins. Um, once again, we have to keep in the middle of those ranges. Um, and the grains are all to be whole grain rich, half 51%. Uh, fat free and low free milk we have to offer. Saturated fat has to be less than 10% calories. Um, there's a maximum limit on sodium. 
There are zero grams of trans fat, and the reversible mm -hmm. meal must contain a fruit or a vegetable. So last year, the child can go through the line. He could um, get a meal that we have analyzed with, um, they could get an entree, they could get two sides, they could get up to three other sides to go with that entree. They go through the meal, and that's a reversible meal. This year, they have to, we have to offer five of those components that are in those ranges. The child must take three of those components, of those three components, and one has to be a fruit and a vegetable. So the changes that the kids are seeing this year that are, aren't very acceptable are mostly our grains. Because last year they could get a whole sub, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a half a sub, a half a sub roll. They can get their side, their um, carbs to go with it. They can get a potato. They can get their vegetable. They can get their milk, and they're good to go. Now, with the menu changes this year, everything appears to be smaller. Your grains are smaller, so they only get a quarter of a sub roll instead of a half. A third of a sub roll. I'm sorry, a third of a sub roll instead of a half. They're, st they're still getting the calories, but the calories that they're getting now are from vegetables and fruit. Um, it's not from all their carbs. So that's the difference they're seeing, and it hasn't been very acceptable right now. <laughs> but we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. So that's the differences that we're seeing right now in the program. In the uh, elementary, it is more acceptable than in high school because they are seeing an, enough food on their plate to fill them. If a high school child was to take everything that they are offered, they can take, that would be a full meal and they, they would be full. They can take a whole cup of fruit, they can take a whole cup of vegetable, they can take a milk, and then they can take their um, protein grain on top of it. So it is a good meal if you take everything mm. that is offered to them, which is what um, USDA is trying to gear towards. That's what they're trying to do. How it has affected this year, Oh, soup is no longer, when we think of um, a lunch, most people are thinking soup and sandwich, but we can't serve soup anymore. It's not, it doesn't meet any nutritional value. And last we put a whole cup of vegetable in that soup, and I don't know what we do with the sodium and base. <laughs> something, we can use something in the olive Yeah, we do not put We can offer whatever is olive oil, which means they have to pay but um, according to these guidelines, a child can come and get a um, cup of fruit, a cup of vegetable, and a milk and that's meal. So, but this what it is, we're going to more healthy. Um, so this is how it's affected our participation. We have a list of color um, participation has gone down this year because of these new regulations. Um, it, it's down roughly between 10, 11 percent what it was last year. And so those kids are bringing their food in then? Pardon me? Those kids are bringing their own food in, bring typically? Food in, yeah. food and if you notice... So they're... Okay. So that's, yeah. And we have many students with free and reduced that don't take it. Our hope is that we have more time to make food you. that will be more acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, all this act came into play so fast, that so quick. quickly, that the manufacturers were <coughs> struggling. So. How are these changes impacting food costs overall? I would imagine your food cost is higher. Our food cost is higher, <laughs> yes, because of the grains, because of the grains and because of the fruit and vegetables, especially this year, um, it's considerably higher. But when you look at it overall, we have roughly about 78 cents per child to feed them for a lunch, 20 cents for this milk. So we do rely on those um, the commodity foods, the USD commodity foods, um, as much as we can. And also, you know, they're adjusting too as we're going out with these new regulations. They're adjusting what foods will be available to us. But um, right now, it's, it's what we have to work with. And we're trying different things. We're trying to you know what we can to uh, use those regulations and to uh, increase participation. 
please, what did you say about, what did you say about that? I said we have many students that receive free and reduced lunches that don't take the lunch. They don't take the lunch. Correct. And that is nationwide that we are finding that. There are so many students that even have a free meal coming in. A lot of it is um, the, uh, the stigma. The stigma. And we try, we try to get away from that, but it, there is still a lot of stigma out there that the children don't come to their free meal. Do we still have kids who like food? I've heard that many times they don't want the healthy food, so they're not eating it. I've heard more that they're not getting it enough, and that's they're not going to pay for it um, when they're not getting enough food. We miss their cars. They want the, the scoop of rice. They want the noodles. They want the dinner roll. I don't. And that's what they're missing because that's what was filling them up. And we can't give them that so much. Well, I mean, never seen kids eating dumplings and rolls either. Right. 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 To say about that. That's where the third vegetable goes that they have to take. They have to take those birds being a reversible meal. They have to have a half <coughs> cup of vegetable or a half a cup of fruit on their tray. One of the things with the perception of the food is I mean, we're trying to mitigate it a little bit. And actually, uh, on this Friday, we're having a guest chef connect. And um, his name is Alex McCray, and he does work for Personal Touch. He um, is a chef at the Buffalo Seminary, and he's been um, in culinary field for over 20 years. And he's going to create a menu, and whatever happens in my menu, <laughs> um, he's going to be doing um, a special tea white pizza, which is going to be infused with the um, garlic oil. And, uh, with garlic oil, sauteed spinach, and Roma tomatoes. It's on the side wall, right? It's on the side wall. It's a salad wrap for the sub line. He's going to do chicken fajitas over here on the Mexi Mexican line and our authentic chicken enchiladas. Oh, sounds good. Um, he's also going to do a Mexican rice, petite corn on the cob, and candy carrots. Mm. Yeah. Something a little different from the show. <coughs> everything fresh. A lot of education yeah. as, as we move forward. Different stuff going nutrients. You know, what you're putting into your body and um, what we're looking forward for for participation is going to go just, Like I said, in the elementary, it's not as bad as um, the middle school and high school. Although we're seeing our biggest impact. After the press release, though, and I will give you a copy of that. Okay. Um, so if you're around on Friday, please come and join us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Where's the largest Do we get the money if they don't use the one? Do we get paid if they don't use the one? It's 5 to 8 12. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, seven, eight, eight, nine, and then we have six through eight, you know, seven and eighth graders here, and then sixth grade over there. We can handle that. The menu for three through five and sixth grade are basically the same. The sixth grader is going to get more food. They might get it. So when the sixth graders come in, then things change? Um, basically, yeah. yes. yes. The same yeah. thing up here with the seventh and eighth graders. Okay. Yeah. We have to separate their meal. Huh? Yeah. They're basically the same, but we're adding to it. Right? The calories fall in between the two uh, groups. So Mr. Mr. Schaefer, the uh, grains mixed it all in the cafeteria. The grains? Yeah, like um, seventh and eighth grade and ninth, do they all come in? Like, Sometimes you have a ninth grader and a seventh grader in. Um, I can't answer that for the high school. Separate at the elementary. There are some schools that we have that are. And I don't, I mean, it's, we do our best. We do our best. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any, anything else you'd like to go through? No? Okay. Hey, anybody have any more questions? No. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, now we'll go on to talk about budget. Um, Lisa will be up first with a presentation. And just so you know, for the overall process, we're just getting started. We are moving the budget process cycle up a bit. Um, the original calendars stated we are going to be doing um, the heart of the budget work pretty much in March, but with, um, with Lisa's departure, we're trying to get as much done as we can before she leaves and trying to get things nailed down pretty well. Um, so that's, that's the plan on that. So we do have uh, several dates already outlined that we will be having budget meetings um, already scheduled. So we have February 25th and February 27th are scheduled for that, as well as we, um, we haven't figured out the format yet, if it'll be the same as last year or we might do it different, but we'll have a public forum on Saturday, March 23rd at 9 o'clock where we'll, um, we'll try and figure out the best way and we're open to suggestions. If you have ways that you think would be good for us to interact with all of you um, in that process, in that particular day, um, please please send them to us. We're, we're open to any suggestions. Uh, we tried some things last year. I think some of it worked well, um, but we can always do things better. So. so those are the dates. So we're just getting started in this process. Um, as you see things, nothing's written in stone. We're just trying to figure out ways to get there. Um, we have some big gaps to fill, and we have to figure out how to get there because that's our, that's what we're we're tasked to do here. So with that, Lisa, if you go ahead and kind of show us where we are to start. Now we'll move over for this. Okay. Before I start with the budget, um, I just want to let you know a couple things. The six cent certification document um, was submitted to New York State Child Nutrition Program today. If that's approved, we will receive an additional six cents on each meal served. Mm. So hopefully we'll hear something soon. I was updating the notice of the annual meeting and budget vote and I found an error in the school calendar. The budget hearing on the calendar is scheduled May 6th, but it needs to be held between May 7th and 14th. So you're going to have to make a change to that. And Dave Martin notified me that we need to meet EPA regulations for admissions on the cogen engines. We'll have to install a new catalytic converter on the 400kW engine to be in compliance. Um, and com we have to be in compliance by October 2013. Siemens provided initial estimate of $25,000. Um, this has not yet been included in the budget. There's a couple options to fund this project. You can use the repair reserve. With that reserve, a public hearing is required before spending. Um, this may be able to be included with the annual meeting notice. You'll have to check with legal. Or you can do a capital project um, in which cost probably will increase, but you'll receive 78.2% um, building aid on the project. Okay. Okay, and now we'll just go over the budget statuses and challenges. Okay, in this first column, here's our revenues and expenditures. Um, this is our budget numbers. We have not updated our fund balance numbers. Next time we go over budget, we should have uh, fairly accurate fund balance estimates as of that date. Our draft one of the budget, the revenues, 25 million. Um, our expenditures, almost 27 million, leaving a budget deficit of 1.7 million dollars. Now the 25 is with all the new state aid that came in. Correct. So that that's a pretty firm number for state aid. Correct. Um, with the governor's budget, now once we see the legislative budget, that may change. Okay. In the past, it's gone up, but who knows? All right. Now, how does the um, the uh, sequester fit in here? I have not built that in yet. I have a meeting tomorrow with my business official colleagues and I'm going to find out what they're using for budget figures. Okay. But if, that, if the sequester actually happens, then is it going to come out? It's that? going to increase our expenditures. Expenditures? It won't decrease the revenue? It increases expenditures? Our federal fund revenue is not in the general fund. Oh. So basically, money we're currently paying for out of our federal funds will have to be diverted to the general fund, increasing expenditures. For salaries. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, and again, our 15, our 14, 15, our deficit's about 2 million, 15, 16, 2.6 million, 16, 17, 3.5 million. All right. So those are all those are all operating deficits. Correct. 
So that's before we apply any kind of reserves and uh -huh. rainy day funds or anything else. Right. Right now, going into the year, we're going to spend the 1.7 million that we're taking in. Okay. Okay. So after applying reserves, our unfunded deficit is 269,000 for 1314. It's about 474 for 1415. 1 1.6 million for 1617 or 1516 and 2.4 million for 1617. And those reserves are spread out that way because last year the board decided the board at that time decided to take the reserves we had and kind of spread them out over the, right. the four years that we can see on the horizon. Mm -hmm. so. no, no, that doesn't take into account the 81,000 that we just threw Good question. It, it does. Uh, the way it does take into account is if you see I reduced the reserve for employee benefits uh -oh, from 100,000 to 10,000. Okay. Because we're going to be using the 80-some thousand okay. this year. Mm-hmm. And in the uh, the 2000 draft one budget, does that include a two percent property tax increase? Correct. So that already bakes in two percent increase. Yes. For the property tax. Okay. Okay. Right. Any other questions on this slide? Okay. And here are some um, again reserve projections after we've used the reserves. Our non-spendable fund balance, um, which is prepaid, we can't use that to offset deficit. Um, one good thing, capital reserve, that will expire in 2017. So you're going to need to decide whether you want to do a capital project, or you can reduce debt service or the tax levy with that, or you can get voter approval to transfer uh, that 400000 to other reserves. And that, <clears throat> that has to be spent on a certain date or committed? Probably committed. And again, that would be a legal question. <coughs> and, and the date relative to that, you said, is when? By when? 2017. Oh. It was approved in May 2007 for 10 years. Um, I think one of the options is... Yeah, one of the options possibly might be to renew that reserve. Again, that would be a legal question. Okay. So here are our combined revenue and expenditure projections in the gap. Uh, current year, 619000 which is funded by, all, by reserves, by our appropriated fund balance. Uh, for 1314, we have our 1 1.7 million, 1415, 2 million, 1516, 2.6 million, and 1617, 3.5 million. And the 619 this year is basically being plugged with reserves right now, right? It's the appropriated fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, our changes to revenue we've had a $119,000 increase in state aid per the governor's budget. We've had $45,000 increase in tuition payments, $256,000 increase in property tax, uh, the 2% per tax cap imposed this current year and in subsequent years continues to limit revenue growth. Um, it does not come close to our contractual and other expenditure increases. And we have not yet budgeted for a potential decrease in federal grant aid due to sequestration. Expended expenses continue to grow at a rapid pace. The health insurance rates are increasing by 43% or $377,000. Teachers' retirement system rates are increasing by 37% or $462,000. The employees' retirement system rates um, are increasing by 14.1% or $96,000. These increases have increased our benefit budget by 17% from 2012-13 to 13-14. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, our teacher salary increase averages about 4% per, per year. Do you have a number for that total cost for next year? year I, I don't. At this point, no, I don't have it broken down. 
Okay, um, based on the scenario, the district will use about $5 million in available reserves and fund balance to help close the gaps. In 13-14, we're going to use about 26% or $1.4 million of that. 14-15, we'll use 27% or $1.5 million. 15-16, we'll use 18% or about $990,000. 16, 17, 20% or 1.1 million, and that will leave 9% or almost half a million left for emergencies. Now, those are based off of the, the parameters we set up last year, the board set up last year, right? Those, yeah. those allocations. Mm -hmm. so, so, for all of us on the board now, we need to think about, and we can either have the discussion tonight or we can think about it at the next meeting, talk about it. Is this where we still, do we still want to use our reserves in this way? Do we want to? Uh, either do more reductions now or later or, or wherever, but do we still want to follow this pattern that we, we, we talked about last year? Because it's a, it's a different group, the world's changed a bit, so is this what we want to do? So be, be thinking about that, and I think maybe next time when we, we go back together, we, we kind of lock down those and take one variable out of the mix. Does that seem reasonable? And then I would further suggest that if there is any fund balance or excess fund balance at the end of the year to increase the reserves, the employee benefit liability reserve and the retirement reserve. Okay. Okay. okay, using reserves will help with the pain. It won't cure the problem. There's a multi-year structural gap between revenues and expenses. New York State doesn't appear to be heading in a direction of significant increases to school funding and the tax cap severely limits the tax rate growth and revenue. We, as a community, we need to work together to make the best choices with limited resources. No one likes change. No one wants their favorite program cut. Help us figure out how to pay for it. And that's all we have. Do they want that projected? I don't know. I don't think so. For your section, Mr. Schaefer, did you want to project it or not project it? May as well. Okay, we'll I, I can get it on here. Yeah. The administration came up with a several recommendations for eliminating the budget gap, which Ms. Almasi said was uh, at about 269 thousand one hundred fifty eight dollars one of the suggestions we've had is to for the district to increase the tax levy from two percent to the tax levy limit plus exclusions this would be an additional source of revenue of uh, one hundred sixteen thousand nine hundred seventy five dollars we also like to mention as we start this for uh, review for the sake of the uh, Board of Education, we started building this budget with some uh, givens. It was a given that we would replace one of the retiring tech teachers at the high school and not replace the other retiring tech teacher. This was just a starting point for the sake of building the budget. It was decided not to replace the high school librarian, uh, not to replace the retiring elementary teacher at Eden Elementary, and to reduce by one FTE the newly hired elementary teacher at GLP. Once again, these were just for the sake of having a baseline to build the budget. The Board of Education was asked about untouchables, things that we wouldn't consider doing at this time. And uh, the Board's untouchable was realignment of the buildings. So administration will not spend any time working on getting the figures for that. Just to clarify, what, what the board decided on that is there's way too much work that has to go into studying that, so it's not something that can happen for next year, but it will happen at some point, probably sooner than later, I would think, given the enrollment sizes and everything else and cost pressures and all of that. But for next year, it, it was not something feasible, so we tried to give you some boundaries on that. Administration decided that although uh, kindergarten is not required. Kindergarten is absolutely essential in this day and age with the increased expectations for reading, writing, and math. Also that was tabled was uh, a major redo of the high school schedule at this time. We had contemplated in the past charging for the use of facilities and this is a number 
that is actually from uh, several years ago and we just uh, put it in there for the sake of discussion. We know that with charging for facilities uh, comes some uh, bad will perhaps with our public and also that we might get a decrease in the amount of people using our buildings because now a charge is involved and that figure is subject to change but that was a figure we had worked up in the past uh, based on a lot of things uh, but to cover the cost of utilities cleaning etc cetera, etc cetera. in the realm of kindergarten through second grade we looked at it was a recommended to retain the 1.0 FTE uh, elementary teacher at GLP and uh, this may need to be added based on kindergarten registration and other enrollments and you can see the figure the additional 67 5 figure at the end of that line we talked and you'll see this come up in several places about redoing the way we deliver uh, art and music particularly and we have a lot more work to do in this area I'm certainly not suggesting we do all of this but it's worth we should at least do due diligence here and look into this at grades 3 through 6 uh, the recommendation from the elementary principal was to increase the 1 FTE uh, that was reduced as it would maintain class size at about 20 per class in five sections as opposed to 25 per class in four sections we felt both the addition of the teacher at GLP and Eden Elementary aligns well with Board of Education goals number one the cons on both of these the downside of course is the additional expense we looked at uh, deleting deletion of the gifted talented program and of course uh, the upside is the cost savings and the needs for the higher level students would have to be addressed during their RTI periods with their classroom ELA teachers and math teachers and of course the downside in this and nobody would argue with this was the, was the loss of a vested specialist in gifted education as I said before as you look further down under three through six a way of uh, doing art and music perhaps as a semestered course one semester art one semester music there is a some gain in minutes which convert into FTEs which convert into dollar savings as we got down to 7th through 12th grade and believe me this is by no way the total list of the pros and cons this is just an immediate overview we looked at 7th through 12th grade looking at the deleting 4.0 full-time equivalents there's cost savings of course we looked at reducing the class size in classes that had 12 or less students we found in the first semester classes there were about 60 classes that had 12 or less students we found in sec second semester classes there were again approximately 60 classes that had 12 or less students we felt this was an equity issue uh, considering the high school and considering the elementary school in class enrollment there and there of course was the hopes that by limiting some of the electives it would drive up the enrollment in the more popular electives the downside of course is less electives and therefore less student choice we looked at reducing extra class clubs Mr. yes can you so maybe for the next meeting can you maybe firm that up a little more what that would look like as far as maybe which electives we'd have to drop or which, which positions it would have to be something that looks a little more tangible so we can uh, especially for someone who's on their kids in that building it, it's harder for us to get what that means yes mr graff and i and the guidance department can work on that we looked at reducing extra class and or clubs uh, most of which are at the high school but not all there are some at the elementary school by 20 percent cost savings but on the other side fewer choices for our students in athletics and this could go anywhere from athletics to to transportation oh I'm sorry I skipped over special education didn't I sorry Mrs. Johnson special education there was a request to look at increasing FTEs and in special education for support in uh, math 
reading and at GLP. This will help us fulfill requirements of uh, IEPs. In athletics, elimination of the five o'clock bus run, cost savings, it does, will create a logistical difficulty for some athletes. Uh, ridership varies, but it's tif typically between five and 20 students. Five to twenty per evening. Yes. That's it. Yes. Is that used by the elementary school as well? No, it's high school sports. There has been some talk, as you look under athletics, in uh, Western New York in se in our section of uh, going to what's called a modified A strategy. That would be where instead of having modified JV and varsity, you would have 789 on what's called a modified A team and 10, 11, 12 on a varsity team. This only works if other schools are doing it, otherwise you don't have anyone to compete against. And the section even has rules against allowing you to compete with a 789 team against a 78 team. So right now it seems as though it's, uh, it's not happening. It seems like a tabled issue. It also seems that nobody wants to be first, but other schools have brought it up before, but at, at the moment it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Another option that many school districts have looked at is uh, deleting their modified sports program. And if that's something we want to look at more, we can get a price tag for fall, winter, and spring modified sports. Can we get a price tag for, we can do for all these things? I think we probably need to add some price tags for everything. Okay. This is only our you know, second time through this, so we needed a little more direction of what we wanted to do and what we wanted to stay away from. We also looked at, uh, there is some text in the state requirements for physical education that does allow schools to use things like athletic competition to satisfy a student's physical education requirements. And uh, one of the suggestions was the varsity athletics to satisfy a phys ed requirement and then re reduce phys ed accordingly, which would translate into FTEs. Are we, are we working on that calculation? Uh, we can start to work on more what that would look like. Yeah. And I guess it probably comes down to a scheduling issue too, doesn't it? When, when the semesters fall versus the sports and things like that. Yeah, we'd have to see, and uh, certainly we'd have to check around the state to see if there's other schools doing this, how they implement it, what are the pitfalls of it if a student were to decide not to play anymore. And uh, if a student becomes injured, of course, they probably couldn't be in their phys ed class anyways. But there's a lot to consider here. It, it, one of the upsides is it may, require, it may open up for a student a chance to take another elective, which may be, become more attractive on their college application. That's right. <laughs> In the realm of uh, transportation, uh, we just got a report. We're, we're beginning to look at what a move to a single bus run would entail. Uh, what it would do for the length of the runs, how many runs we would need to make this happen, and how many drivers, but we uh, just got this at the end of last week, so we had not had time to attach monetary terms to each one of these things, but we are going to be working on fleshing that out a lot more. We also talked about deleting 7 through 12 bus runs in the Weller subdivision. Uh, seventh through twelfth graders, as you know, most of them walk to school, but we still sometimes send, we still send a bus there to uh, pick up students and it, it might be appropriate not to have bus service for seventh through twelfth graders in the su uh, Weller subdivision or for seventh through twelfth graders on school view and perhaps to generalize pickups up and down Route 62 such that 7 through 12 students would walk out to Route 62 to, to meet their buses and at the end of the day get off their buses at Route 62 and uh, walk home. And we have an ongoing, ongoing uh, work on reducing supplies and equipment. With uh, just the things that we have uh, gone over, we have been able to reduce the budget gap. Uh, we realize this is just a preliminary list. We realize they are not imminent cuts, it's just brainstorming. Uh, 
and uh, we realize we have a lot more work to do and we will be getting you more numbers for each one of the upcoming board meetings and for the budget workshops. Is there anything else you'd like added on this list? Um, I was just thinking off the top of my head because one of the things when you when you put a list that is preliminary like this and it only adds up to roughly the target, then it doesn't really give us any choices. So I guess what I'd suggest is probably another couple hundred thousand dollars of choices so that these aren't the only choices. So we actually can make choices, do pros and cons on things because, you know, there, just as some of our speakers tonight talked about, there's, there's very important reasons to maintain some of the programs that are listed here, so we need to look at the others as well. Unfortunately, this is a pretty much a zero-sum game here, so we have to look at everything and figure out where we can, what, what, what we can make some reductions in to allow us to keep some of these programs in place. So I would say, I mean, that's my thought. I'm going to talk to anybody else. Thoughts? Well, I guess we don't have the numbers for a lot of these things right. yet, so it, it could go well beyond the gap at this point. We just don't have those numbers. And so that should give us some choices. That'll help, but we also, we're going to think about for the next meeting, is that truly the gap we want because of the reserves we're plugging in for this year? So depending on what we decide reserves are set at for the next meeting, that may make that bigger or smaller on what we got to do. Uh, questions, anybody, about what, what we have so far? I have a question, Steve. Do you think that we could at least start looking at the closing the GLP, at least um, getting the study started, or find out how much a study would be? Um, I think we'll do that starting next year. So, next yeah, year. if we need to put some money in the budget, I mean, there's probably some things we need to add in here that we're not even including as far as expenditures that we have to do. Um, do, do we have any but, idea what, it, what we might save? Not really. Not at this point. No. No. That's going to take a while to figure that out. There, there could be costs as well. There might be capital improvements necessary to the elementary school in conjunction with that. So it takes a study, right? You you would talk to someone, Scott, for a, on the infrastructure committee, just a quick, quick and dirty study. What costs is about how much to look at? The report of magnitude is about uh, ten thousand dollars for the that's study. Not, that's that's just saying if it's feasible or not to do right. right? It's right. not all the logistics of what you got to add and no. what it's just how can you do it? Yeah. Right. So probably need to put in some money, an expenditure of ten thousand into the budget to cover something. Like that. <laughs> Better to find out now than later. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, this idea about uh, substituting participation in varsity sports for gym, is there any reason we couldn't also look at that for JV and modified sports? I mean, why just limit it to varsity sports? I will uh, get you the regulations and, and send them to you so you can see what they say. Okay. Have we planned on the, there's a question for, for Lisa, have we planned on the um, the addition of a, a full-time curriculum? curriculum? Yes, so that's how the budget started last year, okay. so yes, that's in there. That's still in there. Okay. Um, <coughs> another, I know you're pretty busy running all these different jobs now, Mr. Schaefer. Another area is, I don't know if, it, if you have the opportunity to speak with, say, North Collins or someplace like that around some shared positions. See if they have any interest around that. That's that's always an opportunity. What was that, Steve? Shared, positions. shared positions. Sharing with other districts. That there seems to be a lot of talk. A lot of districts doing that kind of stuff these days. And given that they, particularly in the administrative end of things, they have a lot of positions um, all being done by their superintendent. Um, I'd also ask that you take a look at administrative costs in here. Any options around that? All the all the non non teaching stuff besides transportation. Any other thoughts, anybody? I'm just wondering about the um, we had talked. In previous board meetings about adding um, college-level courses, I'm wondering how that fits in. Yeah. 
You know, we actually looked at that at college level courses. When I said before that there were uh, 60 courses at the high school first semester and second semester that had enrollments of 12 or less, uh, we knew that we would probably not do anything to affect the enrollments of the ones that were college prep courses, New Step, uh, the Hilbert College courses, the uh, AP courses, and in, but that was of the 60, uh, oftentimes less than 10 per semester. And Mr. Graff did budget um, additional training for teachers to add two additional college credit classes. Okay. So that is in there. To make that offering, okay, okay. good. So, Mr. Schaefer, you're saying that the classes have 12 or less students, some of them are already in the classes? Of the 60 classes per semester that have 12 or less, less students at the high school, there are uh, about a little less than 10 each semester that are college level classes. That's like an extra is there any way that we can you know, use art in music as that? Supplement it with art and music? There is a requirement that schools provide gifted education for students. The, uh, the requirement is not specific on how you do it, that you have to have a separate staff member do it, but you have to provide something for them. I can't remember the regulation particularly, but we can look that up. Okay. Well, we appreciate you taking a... Uh, first cut of looking at this this is not going to be a fun process like usual um, but we'll get there somehow so uh, last chance anything else on budget okay anything else you have Lisa Mr. No. Schaefer anything you want to just a superintendent's report okay I just want to know in your uh, let you know in your board packet you have a, a calendar from BOCES and a calendar regarding the regions exams for next year the regions exams for next school year were put a week later in the school year, and that affected the BOCES calendar, and then that therefore has to affect our calendar. Mrs. Carter, Mr. Graff, myself, and the rest of the administrative team will take a look at that because we're going to have to redo our calendar and a look at our contractual agreements with our uh, teacher association, our CSEAs, and adjust the calendar accordingly, plus work in all our requirements for staff development. So we, didn't, we won't have that now, but we'd like to uh, work that, finalize that, and get the blessing from the next superintendent before it's uh, shared with the board. Okay. Andrew, anything you'd like to talk about? Uh, no, there's no new business. No new business. Okay. Uh, anybody else have anything? Okay, just an update on the superintendent search process. Um, we've been in contract negotiations with some candidates, and we're not there yet. So... Um, we will keep you posted on that. <laughs> Sorry, we're sure trying. Okay, anything else? All right, that, with that, I make a motion to enter executive session to discuss the new superintendent contract. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for attending, everyone.